time to start our Bible class tonight, and we thank you for coming. If you are um, a visitor, we welcome you. And of course, even though this is being taped, they're looking at another one. They're looking at the one at home from what I talked about last week. So if you're visiting with us, just let us know. And we will recognize you at this time if you're not a member here at East Side. If, if you're welcome, you've come all the time. You're kind of like not a guest, but we still consider you a guest. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, with, for those who are coming in, we do encourage you to please sit in these two sections. I know I met one tonight. Ruth, glad to have you with us tonight. And then we, there are others. We're glad to have you with us tonight as well. We're going to ask you to please bow your heads for a word of prayer, and we will get started. Our God and our Father who art in heaven, we know that we are always in your presence because you are omnipresent. And we're never out of your presence. We presence, we couldn't hide from you if we wanted to. Your word tells us that we are open and naked before you and that the night is just like the day and so there is no hiding from you but we also know lord that when we talk with you when we call upon you you listen to us you give us your attention specifically because we are your children calling on you as our father and we ask you, dear Father, tonight to be with those who are here, those who are on the way. Lord, we pray for every member of this congregation, for those who are faithful, and for those who are not. We ask, Lord, for those who are faithful, that they will continue to be so. For those who are not, that they will start to be so. Lord, we pray that your word will touch those who were here. We pray to Father that something will be said to cause someone to make the decision to say yes to Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would be with the hearts of every person that's here and those who are not, who are hurting for whatever reason. We ask, Lord, that you touch their hearts and heal their hurts, their pains, their sufferings. And the silent sorrows, we ask that you do that, Lord, like only you can. Please forgive us of our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. We, as we always do, we like to start by reading the text. So we'd encourage you to please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 as we again read the text. And I'm reading from the New King, King James Version. And we want to encourage you to follow along. And thank you all so very much for working with us by sitting in these two sections. That's very kind, because I know some of you have your own seats. It's kind of got your name on it. And we've become accustomed to doing that. But it's good to have each of you to, to work with us in this uh, endeavor. Okay, Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sin for flesh, on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually, mind, spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is 
enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope? for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for those, for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, a peril, a sword, as it is written. For your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the church says amen. Okay. One of my favorite chapters. What a beautiful chapter. We're going to go ahead and ask that we look at the screen, and we're going to start tonight. All right. Romans chapter 8, as we said, life and liberty and the spirit. Quickly. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. This is just a brief review. I'm not going to spend any time uh, on this. Just kind of rehearse what, it, what I said about it in an abbreviated manner. And basically those two verses are saying that the chain of sin and death has been broken for those in Christ. That's us. When the Christian sins, and notice I put in parentheses, not living in sin, it does not equal spiritual death. So, uh, this is a quote. The sin brings death principle has been replaced with the spirit brings life principle. Very simply stated. When a person under the law committed a sin, that person was then rendered spiritually dead. And the law could not give him life again. One sin automatically equaled sinner and it automatically equaled that you are now spiritually dead. Now God, of course, we know, uh, had fellowship with this man and he did all of that in lieu of the fact that Christ would die on the cross. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, or the rest of the chapter, explains that reality. But the law could not restore a person to life, spiritual life, or bring them back into their prior condition. The life condemned, the law condemned. If a person did not keep it perfectly, it meant sin equals death. But when you are in Christ, that is not the truth. If we sin, we're not automatically spiritually dead. We still have a relationship with God. We're not talking about living in sin. I'll get to that in just a moment. So, Christ has made a difference now. The Bible does not teach. And this is one of the things that I decided I needed to talk about a little bit so that we can all be on the same page. The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. Now, there are people, there are religious organizations, and for the majority, most of those who are in the evangelical community under the umbrella of Christendom believe in this theology of once saved, always saved. But that is not what the Bible teaches, all right? And you might say, well, what, what about eternal life? Well, everybody's going to live it forever, either with God or apart from God. So eternal life is not just living forever. It is a relationship with God uh, that is never ending. And that is abundant life whereby I am forever in fellowship with God. Now, John Calvin's famous TULIP theory is not biblical. And TULIP is just an acronym. And we'll talk about what that means. I'll run through this real quickly. Um, the T stands for total depravity, meaning that man is unable to choose good over evil. Here's what Calvin taught. Basically, and there are many who still hold to this, not all of those in the evangelical community believe this, but some do. The Reformed churches, a lot of them believe this. Basically that a man is born totally depraved that he does not have the capacity to do good, that he does not have the capacity to make a choice for God. Well, you know, obviously that's not right because we're not born sinners. 
Well, I've already talked about that and shown you that in Scripture that we're not. And so people run to, to uh, we looked at Romans 5, and we talked about what, what Paul was saying in Romans 5. And you can't run over to Psalm 51, where David talks about, in sin my mother conceived me, because there you're talking about poetic exaggeration. When you look at the text, like David said, I am a worm. He's not literally a worm. But he's using that to talk about how bad he feels about himself as a man who is uh, subject to sin. So here's what you need to understand. A person is not born a sinner. Now we have the proclivity towards sin. And it doesn't take long for us to sin. But we're not born a sinner. So here is the thing. So for Calvin to say that we're totally depraved, then that would just totally throw out Romans chapter 2, where the Bible talks about the fact that the Gentiles who did not have the law did by nature the things that the law required. So right there in the book of Romans, that whole theory goes out of the window. Man has a capacity to make a choice when he's given that choice. Okay? So Calvin said he can't do it. And so that's why he goes further into this whole idea of total depravity. He comes up with the idea of unconditional election. That simply means that God chose certain ones to be saved and certain ones to be lost. Well, that is true in the sense that he chose those who are in Christ to be saved and those who are outside of Christ to be lost. But what he did not choose is who that individual or those individuals would be. He did not say, George Williams, I want you to be saved. Liliano, I want you to be lost. Okay? Well, this because of the t-shirt that she has on. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's just a name. All right? God did not say that I'm going to go through the earth picking out certain ones to be saved and certain ones to be lost. The very golden text of Scripture denies that. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So how could you read that text and conclude that God wanted certain ones to be lost? But Calvin taught that God had unconditional election, meaning that I just, out of my own love for you, just decided to choose you. And I'm sorry if I didn't choose you, I'm sovereign. So that's too bad. What kind of God is that? Okay. So you didn't do anything to deserve it. I just chose you. So that's unconditional election. He says God only chose a few. All right. So the rest of us, basically what he did was created us as few for the fires of hell. That's what you would have to believe. So God made all of these people. And I only wanted the certain ones to be saved. So why did you create the rest of them? Well, I needed something to fuel hell. I don't know how anybody could believe that. But they do. Well, this leads one to say then there's limited atonement. Limited atonement simply means Christ didn't die for everyone. He only died for the elect. Again, God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I can give you a multitude of scriptures that would defeat that whole concept. You know, God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. How in the world can you say that God wants some to perish? So, they say, well, Christ only died for those who would be elected to be saved, those that he did not choose to save, he didn't die for them. Okay? Then you have I standing for irresistible grace. Now this is how he gets beyond this concept of freedom of choice. Because what he says is simply this, that the Holy Spirit of God will give the elect faith. So he's saying that a person cannot choose to do good because he's totally depraved. 
So a person could not choose to believe in God because he's totally depraved. So God says, since I elected you, what I'm going to do is my Holy Spirit is going to work directly on your heart and make you believe. So you don't have a choice. You will believe. I ask why I preach the gospel. If they're going to be saved anyway, what's the point of the Great Commission? Go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Makes no sense. But that's what they say. Okay? Well, if you don't believe this, Google it when the class is over. You know, people don't believe the preachers anymore. They got to go check Google. <laughs> all right. And then, of course, they come up with the last of the tulip theory is perseverance of the saints. In other words, the elect will never fall away. So this is where this concept of once saved, always saved comes in. So basically he's saying that if you are truly part of the elect, you will never stop believing. You'll never stop. You're just going to believe, believe, believe you forever be saved because you will not stop. So what they do then is take care of the concept of those who were faithful but decided, I don't want to serve God anymore. And the argument is, well, they were never saved. Because had they been saved, they would not have stopped serving God. Well, again, you deny freedom of choice. That God has given man freedom of choice. That is what the tree in the garden represented. Did you not know that? I often ask God, or thought about it in my heart, why put the tree there anyway? You know, and then tell him, don't eat that tree. You know what we're going to do. No. God said, in order for man to truly be free, there has to be a choice. If there is no choice to do wrong, then it's not freedom. So God gave him a command, do not eat of this tree. I don't know what it is. You know, Satan came along and pointed it out and said, look, well, look at this tree. Forget about all of the rest of them. And that's what we do. That's that one tree. I don't care how many others I have. I just want that one. And man made a choice. And we're still dealing with that now. But we still have the choice. God does not take it away before we become Christians. And he does not take it away after we become Christians. It is still our choice. Okay? So that's the whole tulip theory concept once saved always saved you're totally depraved you can't make any decisions for God and of course unconditional election and so forth and so on so God this is what Calvin said and those who believe in that that's what they believe can we move to the next one if you will all right let me quickly just take a break this is what we're doing here we're, I want you to see that a Christian can so live as to lose his or her salvation or be disinherited, okay? However, and this is important that you understand this, it would mean that one abandons his or her faith and chooses to live a life of rebellion. Amen. It's not a matter of just committing a sin. Because Paul said that has been broken in Christ that sin automatically equals death. Because in Christ, we are not under condemnation. And in order for us to be condemned, we must make a conscious decision to say, I no longer want to serve God. I want to live in rebellion to God. Now, I put myself in opposition with God and I no longer walk in his favor nor in his fellowship. I am now walking in darkness and the fellowship is broken. Okay? So, let's look at this. All right. Our salvation is not fickle or tenuous. It's not shaky. It's not fragile. Amen. It is not, it, it is steadfast. 
It is steadfast. I've been preaching this a long time now. So I'm just trying to bring balance so you don't get lost in this. Okay, watch what I'm saying. We should not have to worry about our salvation. John said, these things have I written unto you that you might K-N-O-W know that you have eternal life. And this eternal life is in Christ Jesus, his son. So, I'm not fearful of losing my salvation. Are you? I didn't hear too much. Okay. I kind of saw a few heads kind of halfway shaking. Oh, I might be. No, no. We have no reason to fear losing our salvation. I'm not afraid of hell, and I'm not afraid of the judgment. Because you come to the end of Revelation, John says, the Lord said, behold, I come quickly. And John said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. So the Christian's attitude is, I'm always ready. And I'm not concerned about it because when Jesus comes again, it's a hallelujah, praise the Lord time because I am victorious in Christ. Right? So, I'm not concerned about the judgment. The judgment will not be a time of condemnation for the child of God. It will be a time of condemn, commendation. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen? Not depart from me, you workers of iniquity, but come ye, blessed of my Father. See, this is the difference between a child of God and a person who does not have a relationship with God. That person has to fear the judgment, but a Christian says, I welcome it because it's not a time of punishment, but a time of reward. Amen? So, Christ did not die and just to turn around and condemn us and send us to hell. Think about it for a moment. I think I kind of talked about this when I was preaching through Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, he's, he'll, he's, bringing the, he's bringing the mic. I talked about that in Ephesians chapter 1 when Paul talked about God in Ephesians 1, 3 before the foundation of the world had already decided in his mind that Christ would die for our sins. So this plan was in his mind before he ever said, let there be light. Okay? Before he ever hung the sun that we saw eclipsed. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Wasn't that amazing? Lord have mercy. Two o'clock in the day, it got dark. That's amazing. But, you know, I'm saying, God didn't do all of this it is mine say, before I ever create man, I know what's going to happen. I know man's going to mess up, but I'm going to have a cleanup for his mess up before he messes up. All right? And then he let his son, you think about the condensation of, con, when God condescended, condescension of God, that God literally in the person of Jesus Christ became a human being and subjected himself to what we as human beings have to deal with every day. Jesus was not almost a man. As I said last, he was not a demigod. He was 100% God, 100% man. Hence, he dealt with what we deal with. This is God, our creator, became what we are to redeem us. Why would he go through all of that and then allow his son to suffer at the hands of wicked men in such a fashion that human, the human mind cannot even comprehend just to say that it's all left up to you 100% and all you got to do is just make one mistake and zap, you're gone. God is not like that. And that is not the picture we see in Scripture. Yes. Yes, sir. Would you, would you say that the... Um you know, in the flesh, the the work of the the work we do in the flesh with the, with the spirit. You know, as this, as we worship Christ, the works in the spirit that we do in the flesh will produce the fruit of the spirit that we need. The fruit in the spirit, as well as getting that. But I kind of got left behind here. Um, okay, I mean, maybe, but let you me see what I'm saying? It's kind of re repetitive. It's like bam, you know. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, let me see if I understood exactly. If I'm not getting it exactly right, you can rephrase it. Yes, sir. But what I hear you saying. The works in the flesh are equivalent to the, the fruits of the spirit. No, sir. No, the, the not equivalent. To the, the works the, of the flesh in Galatians a, chapter 5. The paradox, yeah. Paul clearly delineates what those are. In Galatians chapter 5, let yes, me sir. just turn over and read it. No, that's what's coming out of the record. All right. That's a good question. No bad questions. No bad questions. We're good. All right. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse number 19. And Paul makes a distinction between the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. Now, I think you may be saying what we do in the flesh for good. Okay. But I just want to read these two things and then I'll comment on that. Is that all right? All right. So Paul makes a distinction because he talks about we can know when we're walking in the spirit as versus walking in the flesh. And Paul says, now the works of the flesh are evident, clear. You can't miss them. Which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revilers, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, as of which I told, tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past. But those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. So, as a Christian, I will participate in good works and do things that God commands me to do. But I am not doing those things to earn salvation. I am doing those things as a result of being saved. Okay? It's like, again, let me put it in this light. I am faithful to my wife and I do the things that I do for my wife to demonstrate my love for her. To show that I love her. To express that love in deeds and actions. Because love is a verb and a noun. So I'm not just talking about love, but I am in the verb form demonstrating love. God so loved that he gave. And so when we love, we do. And so our relationship with God is to be predicated upon love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So it's not about me saying that I want to rebel against God. A person who loves God will not, not want to rebel against God. He will not want to do that. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't detach ourselves from God and begin to do things that are contrary. That's why Paul says this in Galatians chapter 5. So, we do good works, but not to say that I'm trying to earn God's salvation. Salvation is a gift. Okay, I think that answer, is that, did that answer you? All right, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. I don't want to be answering something that's not the question. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, any other questions or comments before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Let's get you the mic. I was just, I have a question about the tulip. I was just wondering, do you, um, the, the first part where it's total depravity, mm -hmm. how do they handle the, the part that Christ was actually born himself so if you're born into sin, how do they handle the Christ being born into, uh, into the world, but not a sinner? Okay, what they do is basically say that the Holy Spirit of God was responsible for the birth of Christ, which he was, according to the Bible, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you become uh, pregnant with a child and so man had nothing to do with it. And so what they try to say is that Adam's blood is tainted with sin. So had uh, Joseph been involved with her, then it would have been of man. Then his blood would have been tainted. 
But since man had nothing to do with it, God just used the womb of Mary, that then that meant that his blood was not contaminated because it was all God's doing and man had nothing to do with it and she was just a tool. And so that's how they get past that. Okay, any other questions or comments before we move? Okay, all right. Um, I appreciate the questions. There are no bad questions. All right, let's move on. Now, what we're gonna do here is simply show now that the Bible does teach that a person can forfeit their salvation or be disinherited as God's child. That does not again get it out of your mind. I don't want you going home tonight saying, oh, I'm scared. No, you shouldn't be afraid um, unless you plan on saying, forget you, God. I don't want to serve you. I'm going to live like I want to do and do what I want to do. If you're going to do that, then you need to be afraid. Okay? But if you don't plan on doing that, go to sleep. All right? Okay. We're going to ask these brothers to pull up the, t the passages that I asked you to pull up. We're going to start with uh, Hebrews. Let me get this back. All right. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Now, those of you who have studied the Bible and you know what Hebrews is about, you understand then that what you have is a group or a church that is on the precipice of apostatizing. And that means to stray away from the line. You're going to deviate, leave the faith. And here you have a group of Christians who were Hebrews, Jews, that were on the verge of leaving Christ, leaving Christianity, and going back to Judaism. They're going to leave this New Testament, this new covenant that God has made with man and given man and return to the Old Testament law. Now, what's going on? What's precipitated this? Well, you don't really get into it until you get to chapter 10 where he starts talking about how they have suffered but not to the point of blood, okay? So what's happening is you got to understand that Judaism was a sanctioned religion. Rome sanctioned Judaism. So consequently, they were exempt from persecution. Rome said, you can, you can practice your religion. We're going to let you do that. And all of the others that we sanctioned, they can practice their religion. Christianity came on the scene. It's the new kid on the block. It is not sanctioned by Rome. But not only is it not sanctioned by Rome, it is looked upon by the Jews as a false religion. And so now you have the Gentiles, Romans in particular, that are anti-Christian. And you have the Jews that are anti-Christian. So everyone is hostile toward Christianity and the church. They are suffering. And they're not only suffering emotionally, but their properties are being confiscated. They are suffering economically, and some are even suffering physically. But here is the mindset. Well, before we became Christians, we could at least worship God without being in fear of losing everything. So we are tired, tired of suffering for this Christ. We're tired of losing everything in the name of this Jesus. And so what we're going to do is just go back to Judaism and forsake Christianity. So this is what the author of the book of Hebrews is writing to try to say to them, you are about to make the worst mistake in your life to leave the best thing that ever happened to you and to return to something that is inferior when you have that which is superior. So in chapter 1, he begins to talk about Jesus Christ and who he is, how he's in the image of God. 
and that the angels worship him. All of this is said, and he's called God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So he says, none of the angels have ever been called the son of God. You are my son. Today have I begotten you. And so he goes through all of this to show that Christ is superior on every level. His blood is superior to those animal sacrifices. His nature is superior because he is God. Not only that, but his, his covenant is superior. Not only is his covenant superior, but I want you to understand he says that his salvation is superior. Everything about Jesus Christ, I'm not trying to name all of them because there are many of them that you can bring out in the book of Hebrews that he's talking about the superiority of Jesus Christ and the superiority of Christianity over the old covenant. His priesthood is superior. Everything about him is superior. You're going to leave that and go to something that is inferior. You know, that's like saying, and I don't know, this is not a, uh, you know, an equal comparison, but I'm just trying to bring this maybe to where we are now. I don't know what your favorite luxury car is or whatever, but let's just say you got an old beat up Toyota or let me go back further than that. Uh, what are some of these old cars that they were just, they were lemons from the start. Just give me one. Huh? Pacer, okay. Let's just say you have, let's just say you have a Bentley and it's yours. You owe nothing on it. All right? Now, I don't know how much they cost now. I just remember years ago, years ago, years ago, I was uh, in Florida with my friend Robert Smith. Y'all know Robert Smith. Some of you met him at my 40th. And so he took his car in. He didn't have a Bentley, but he took his car there and they sold Bentleys. And I saw one on the showroom floor and I just decided, well, I just want to see what it cost. Well, they didn't have the price on the, on, on the car. They had one in there, but it was just turned upside down. And basically they said, if you have to ask, you can't afford it. So I looked at it and it said $325,000. That was years ago. And I said, who in the world would do that? That's a house. But just imagine now, you don't owe a thing on it. You don't even have to pay your insurance. It's just covered. Everything is covered. All you got, you don't even have to put gas in it. All of the gas is provided. The insurance is provided. All maintenance is provided. Everything. You just drive it. But people start hating on you because you got it. You think you're somebody. Oh, we're going to do something to you. And you say, you know, I had it better when I was in that pacer. It wouldn't run half the time. I couldn't crank it up at all. It, nothing, it, nothing worked on it. But at least folk didn't hate me. So let me ask you a question. Who's going to give up the Bentley to go back to the pacer? That's what the author is saying. You're giving up the best to go back to something that's far, far inferior. And so he's trying to tell them, you don't understand the spiritual ramifications of what you're about to do. Okay, keeping that in mind. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Now watch this. Calvin said you can't turn away from God. That if you, were, if you turn away from God, you were never a brother or sister in Christ. Well, this author doesn't know that and he's inspired by God. This made the New Testament canon. I believe the Bible before I believe Calvin. So these individuals were brothers and sisters in Christ. And he says, you can have an unbelieving heart. And you can turn away from the living God. How can you turn away from someone that you're not turned toward? Okay? I can't get off the highway unless I'm on it. Okay? But encourage one another daily. As long as it is called today. So that means as long as you have life and you're living in the here and now. Okay? 
So it's not a particular day, it's every day. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So that tells me that a Christian's heart can become hardened by sin. And he says sin is deceitful. Oh, it looks good. Feels good, smells good, tastes good, but it's destroying you. Okay? Are y'all with me? We have come to share in Christ. How is an unbeliever going to be sharing in Christ? If indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. Here it is, a condition here. If indeed we hold to our conviction firm to the end. All right? So that's something we must do, and that is remain faithful. Don't turn away from God. As has been just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. He's a quotation here talking about how God's people rebelled against him repeatedly when he brought them out of Egypt. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Who were they that heard and rebelled against God? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? But is that God's people? Yes. Keep going. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So can you disobey? I'm sure you can. So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. You can fall into unbelief. I'm not going to say that's something that's easy to do because these individuals here that he's talking to, they had suffered for a while because Paul is not talking to new converts because when you get to chapter 5, he said, by this time you ought to be teachers. So you've been in the church long enough to have grown up spiritually, but you are still on milk. But it's not a matter of not having enough time to be on meat. You're dull of hearing. You're just hard-headed. You won't listen. All right? So, the next verse, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, and we'll have to close here. For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who once were once what? That's an expression that means they came to the knowledge of the truth and responded. Watch. Those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit. Unbelievers don't share in the Holy Spirit. You don't have God's spirit in you. These are Christians who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. So what does he say? This is what happens. He's saying to those Hebrew saints who are saying, we're going to go back to that old covenant. We're leaving Jesus. He says, if you do that, you need to understand what you're doing. What you're doing is turning away from salvation and you are crucifying Christ again through your rejection of him. Look at what we're talking about. Rejection of Jesus. Turning away from. Apostatizing. Not, I sin today, so my salvation is in jeopardy. No. It is turning away from God rebelling against God, forsaking Jesus Christ. 
And when we get to chapter 10, you're going to see exactly what he's saying. Because he says, if you do that, there is no other sacrifice for sin. So if you leave Jesus, there's no other way to be saved. That's it. So all I want to do is just bring some light to the situation, to the situation that we don't fear losing our salvation, but we are not to get lackadaisical and just decide I don't have to do anything. I'm not earning salvation, but God does say love responds in faithfulness. And you can fall away, but you're going to have to just totally abandon God to do that. Let me say this as I close. A person who's struggling with sin is not lost. Amen? Here's what you need to understand. If you're not struggling, something ain't right. I don't mean, the struggle is going to always be there. For some, it's more intense than others. It depends on how much you feed the spiritual man or woman, okay? But the stronger you get, the greater the intensity of the test. Amen. Ain't no sense in Satan. Satan can't test me with five pounds. If I'm in the gym lifting 150, 250 pounds, five pounds ain't no test. Now, if he has me to hold it up 24 hours, that might be a test. Because the arm is going to come down. But I'm saying, you have to understand, when Job went through the test, Satan knew he couldn't put no little stuff on Job. I can't test him with like, you got a cold today, got a toe ache. You know, some of us get a toe ache, we fall out with God. God, let my toe hurt. I can't bleed at it. Well, I'm just, just, oh, you know, he let me lose my job. I can't. Job had, man. That ain't bothering me. Satan knew that he had to come at him with all guns blasting to try to take him down because of his steadfastness with God. So what I'm saying to us is this. Christians, we do have our struggles. We only lose the battle when we stop fighting the fight. Okay? If I just lay down and say, you know, I'm giving up. I'm quitting you can't win if you quit. But get this, you can't lose if you don't quit. And it does not matter. Here is the thing about Christianity, what's so beautiful. It does not matter if you cross the finish line running full speed or crawling. God said, just, just cross it. Amen? You might cross it straight up. I might cross it crawling, battered and bleeding. But God says, George, just cross it. You all right. That's what God says to us. Just don't quit on me. Amen? If you're here tonight, you're not a Christian, you're not a child of God, we want to invite you to become a Christian. There's nothing greater in the world than being a Christian. I have salvation. I have freedom in Christ. I don't have to try to earn it. I don't have to try to put God in my debt. That ain't going to happen. It's already been done. I don't have to fear the judgment. I don't have to fear Jesus coming again. I don't have to fear going to hell. I know that heaven is my home. And unless I lose my mind, and rest assured, if I quit, y'all just call the people. Just call them. So I know Brother Williams has lost his mind. I'm telling you, that's right. I'm telling If I quit, I'm not in my right mind. So y'all know something has happened to me. I'm broke. And I'll make it on a baby ticket then. I'll be okay. Y'all know what I said, right? I'll make it on a baby ticket. So I'm just simply saying, I don't fear hell. Don't fear being lost. I'm safe and secure in Christ Jesus. And so are you. Just don't forsake him. Amen. Now here's what I want to say. You know, the author of the book of Hebrews said that we ought to encourage one another every day. Who are you encouraging? Who are you encouraging? Are you encouraging anyone? Or are you in the business of
discouraging. You don't folk at east side, they ain't right. There's some bad people over there. Yeah, bad people everywhere. Everywhere. Amen. I usually use this, this analogy. You know, people always talk about hypocrites. I can't stand a hypocrite. Hypocrites everywhere. Well, you might be one. You're talking about everybody else is a hypocrite. Sometimes you're the one. But listen, we deal with hypocrites everywhere, don't we? Yeah, you work with them. You don't quit your job because you got bills to pay. Right? You get on a plane. It could be full of hypocrites. Huh? You've heard me say this. It's not something I knew. What if the pilot came on and said, hey, you know, I'm a hypocrite. And you are way up in the air over the ocean. You know what I'm saying? Open this door let me out of here. You just say, can you fly the plane and land it? That's all I need to know. I don't have to be a hypocrite because you are. Amen? And being around them don't make me one. And there are many folk in the church who are wonderful, salt of the earth, light of the world people. And they're all around you tonight. Amen? Amen. And that is not to say that those who are not here aren't. I'm just trying to say, don't let one or two people that you run into give you a bad taste about everybody in the church. Because I promise you, there are more good here than there are bad. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and he was buried and he rose again, if you're willing to repent of your sins, confess the name of Jesus Christ, and tonight we will baptize you in water for the remission of your sins. If you want to do that, let us know at this time. Okay. I'm going to ask Brother Hardiman to come and give us our closing. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, we're going to ask him to go ahead and do this part on the taking of confessions or a prayer request I do have to leave immediately and so I know if I don't do that immediately I'll get caught up so I'm going to let Brother Hardman come and do the closing you all just pray for me thank you God bless you I love you Eastside your wonderful church All right,